So we're delighted to have Richard back with us. Um, or when I say back, back here on Zoom teaching a class. If, as you remember, in, some of you were part of the, in the summer, Richard gave a class on art and Jewish art and Tisha B'Av. And that was a course that addressed the theme of mourning, uh, the three weeks of mourning, and of course, Tisha B'Av. And it was also featured one of David, David Wanda's uh, Haggadah. Tonight, we're doing a, a sort of a, a reversal, a 180 degree reversal. And this is Simchat Purim. Uh, no mourning, but joy. And tonight we have the works of, of the first work we'll see, we're going to see is Esther and Achashverosh. Mm -hmm. And this is by the uh, artist Artemisia Gentileschi. I just love that name. Uh, I could say it again and again. And um, so we're looking forward to this. Um, I would just say, Richard, the floor is now yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, folks, I know... Some of you and those I don't know, I know you by sight. And uh, thank you to the Sand Street uh, Shul and uh, to Jeff for uh, letting me uh, look into a really fascinating artist. So, but uh, a little bit of uh, truth in advertising. Um, indeed, there is one painting which relates directly to um, the Megillah and that is uh, Esther before Ahasuerus. Um, but we're not gonna start with that painting. Uh, and, uh, it, this painting, well, I've known it for years. It is normally hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, it was recently in an exhibition in London, the London National Gallery, that was a, sur a yet another survey of Artemisia's work. And so we're going to talk about her, and we're going to talk about the fact that uh, she's unusual in many different ways. One of them is the fact that she's a woman artist, and that also out of her, we have about 53 examples of her work, uh, something like 25% of them uh, have Jewish subjects. Um, and when I say Jewish subjects, uh, only, only one of them actually has a Jewish subject that is part of our canon of Tanakh, but all the rest are essentially late uh, late Second Temple Jewish literature that found its way into um, uh, into the Catholic canon and and or the apocrypha of of the Protestants and so they very much are Jewish stories. Uh, some of them they have the original he Hebrew text. Some of them are they only they're all we have is in Greek, but of course Greek was something that Jews spoke and wrote in in the late Second Temple period. And so we're going to look at her and we're going to figure out a couple of things. We're going to say, what do these paintings and these themes, what do they mean to Artemisia? She is not Jewish, very much a Roman Catholic. Uh, and of course, what do they mean to us? We're going to try to put her in her historic setting and answer some of those questions. And what is her setting? Well, okay, her years are um, from 1593, she's born in Rome, until um, uh, 1652, she dies in Naples, probably from the plague. Um, uh, she's all of 61 years old when she dies. She's actually uh, an amazingly successful artist, especially again, because she is a woman artist. This is really, really unusual. Um, and so to give you a little background about images, just images in the 17th century, I quote, early modern Italy images were powerful, more specifically painting that received the extensive theoretical and critical attention. Indeed, it was considered a means of communication so powerful that it could change lives. Uh, this is from a, actually a, a, a catalog on her work, an introduction. And she goes on and says, our digital imagery available on the internet has become subject to, of course, heated debate concerning potential harm that images may cause. In the 16th and 17th century, painting occupied a central uh, place in cultural politics and issues that were no less highly regarded and highly charged. So we're not just looking at illustrations, things that you might find in a book. We're looking at images that carried weight. They were bought by people with money and an influence and for a reason. And so we're gonna look, look at that. So let's see here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. And uh, okay. And there we go. 
Okay, good. And let me just see if we can get it down to just, uh, yeah, I don't even need to look at me. Okay, good. All right, good. So I told you her years. She was easily the most famous 17th century woman painter. There were others, a handful. Actually, I'm just thinking of two, uh, but by and large, they did not tackle the kinds of subjects that she did. She competed with the top artists of her time in, 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 in painting classical, Christian, and biblical subjects. Uh, one source I went to actually said she may have been the first woman in history to make a living from painting. As a young woman, she was aware of and she was influenced by Caravaggio. Uh, actually, Caravaggio was a drinking buddy of her father. Her father, Orazio Gentileschi, trained her in drawing and in painting. Uh, while that's important, um, which was, you know, that was one way an artist became an, an artist. Because they were trained by their, their father, usually. Um, it was extremely unusual for a woman to be trained. And we're going to see some a little bit of her background. To give you a little bit larger view of, of, of how she exists in her time, she is contemporaneous with, get this list, with Rembrandt, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, Diago Velasquez, Peter Poor Rubens, Johannes Vermeer, Pietro de Cortona, Anthony van Dyck, and Nicholas Poussin. This is the top artists of the 17th century she's painting and making a living, mind you, at the exact same time. As I mentioned, we have about 53 extant works of her that can be uh, identified as hers, uh, and but at least 15 are of Jewish subjects. We have a goodly number of paintings that are missing. And by the way, how do we know this? We know this because we have extensive correspondence. She wrote a lot. Early on when we encounter her, she can barely read, she cannot write, but over the years she learned to write and she's a, she is a, uh, a competent letter writer who is constantly making contracts, ordering supplies, uh, talking to patrons uh, about what they want, delivering paintings and getting paid. So we know a lot about her. She even early on, when she's 23, she is admitted in, admitted in Florence to the Florentine Academ Academia del, della Arte del Designo. She is really someone to be dealt with. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh. Now, I did mention that she's trained by her father. Okay, she's trained in drawing and she's trained in painting. She is hobbled, you're not gonna see it, but she's hobbled by the fact that in her time, not only women did not necessarily become, um, become artists, but also they did not work for models. So whatever it is, it's pretty clear that she must have worked some, some models, but she is an outsider. She is doing things that most women's never did, again, because strict strictures against women being in a modeling class, either with a male model or a female model. So it is quite unusual. Uh, okay, so I, let's, I'm gonna go through a little bit of uh, uh, phrases of her life, all right? And that is, she's born in 15, uh, 1593, uh, and uh, her, her father, Orazio Gentileschi, kind of a second or third rate artist himself, really quite competent, but, uh, uh, not really famous in his time. He managed to make a living. Uh, but anyway, he's a follower of Caravaggio. So, and that really, at that time, when he's meeting Caravaggio, is really changing his style. So this kind of very dramatic, uh, dramatic lighting, chi chiaroscuro, the, the great um, uh, contrast between light and dark in paintings. Okay. So when she's 11 years old, her mother dies, which means that as the oldest in the family, she's taking care of her four brothers. So not only is she in the household with her father, with her brothers taking care of them, but then also being trained as an artist. In 1611, uh, Agostino Tassi, who is a landscape and seascape painter, uh, who, and who also is her, her father's collaborator, was hired to teach her perspective. He comes into the household uh, and he is 34 years old at the time. She is 17 years old at the time. Supposedly he is being, being hired to teach her, but he decides to start to pursue her uh, romantically and sexually. And within the year, he rapes her. He then promises marriage. The promise is kind of hollow because he's actually already married. And then after a short while, when she presses, continues the relationship, uh, he reneges. Well, her father, Orazio, is infuriated. 
this this man, of course, you see, is is his partner, who he's welcomed into his house, and now he has raped his daughter. He takes him to trial. He takes him to court, not just any court, but the papal court, the curia of Pope Paul V, to prove, in fact, again, Orazio takes Tassi to court to prove that he, quote, deflowered her. You can imagine what this must be like for a 17-year-old. Artemisia voluntarily submits to uh, what's called stabile, it is thumb torture. Okay, she voluntarily, sum voluntarily submits to it to prove that she is telling the truth and she survives it. it it's, it's basically a vice that, that basically starts to crush your fingers and, and this is a th for a thumbs to crush your thumbs. So she tries to prove to the court, in fact, that he raped her. And in fact, the court believes her. Tassi was found guilty of rape of a virgin and of suburning witnesses. Unfortunately, the Pope overturns the conviction. But he is, at least for that point or part, part of time, out of, out of her life. Almost anyone who writes about her maintains that this experience sets the stage for the emotional tenor of much of her artwork that is to follow throughout her career. The vast majority of Artemisia's art depicts women, and it is not a stretch to say at all that she is a proto-feminist. She infuses her heroines with remarkable courage and sensitivity and intelligence. So that's a bit of background of what you're about to see. <laughs> but just one more moment. Who are the people that buy her work? Ah, they're all wealthy men. Naturally, that's who is buying. They're either nobility, minor nobles, uh, lords, etc. They're wealthy men. And they're in the market for something very unusual because what she paints is tainted by her history, which is public. It was a public trial. And so they see pictures of the women that she paints, powerful women, whether they're murderesses or seductive nudes, titillating subjects all the more so when painted by a woman, so that the heroines on the canvas start to merge with the female artist who's, who has a scandal still attached to her name. So she, again, is quite unusual. So let's see here. Let's see the next, see Daisy. Uh, here we go over here. Okay. This painting is Susanna and the Elders. This is the earliest painting that we have of hers, I believe anyway, it's signed. It's signed down here, okay? Very clearly signed by her. Uh, and uh, it is uh, currently in, in Naples, as a matter of fact, if I'm correct, yes. Um, and so anyway, sorry, it's in, in Germany, it's in Germany, pardon me. And so, uh, oh, I wanna stop for a moment. Now I'm gonna be uh, explaining to you these subjects. Uh, and so I'm going to be reading the um, um, description, either the description of the subject or actually the text these subjects come from. If you have questions, please interrupt me. I want you to ask your questions as you see the images and as you, as we're being uh, 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 involved in these things. So Susanna, Susanna is uh, found in the uh, book of Daniel which we have, but it's the 13th chapter, which we do not have in our Tanakh. It's called the Greek addition to the book of Daniel. And, and as I said, it is not in the Jewish canon. Susanna as a character is a very uh, passive victim characterized though by her pietistic belief that God's justice will prevail. The story though, in its context, historical context of second temple Judaism is a pharisaic criticism of lax Sadducean court procedures. So here's the story. A very beautiful and pious Jewish woman married to a rich and important man in the Babylonian diaspora named Susanna is falsely accused by lecherous voyeurs. As she bathes in her garden, having sent her attendants away, two elders spy on her bathing. The two men realize that they both lust for Susanna. They accost her, demanding that she has sex with them. She refuses. If she refuses, sorry, they will claim that the reason she sent the maids away was in fact to be alone and have sex with a young man under a tree. That's what they threaten her with. She refuses to be blackmailed. She is then arrested and put on trial and put to, about to be put to death for adultery. Okay, when the young 
Daniel appears. He interrupts the proceedings and shouting that the elder should be questioned to prevent the death of an innocent. So what does he do? He questions the elders separately and about the details of what they saw. And so the first one says, oh, I saw it. It happened under a mastic tree. And the other one in another room says, I saw it. It happened under an evergreen oak tree. It was obvious they were lying. The court realizes they're lying. It's pl praying to, plain to, uh, to all the observers. And in fact, the false witnesses, right? Uh, the Adim Zomimim are put to death and virtue triumphs. That's the story from the book of, uh, the book of Daniel. So, but what do we have here, Susanna? So first of all, and this, and this by the way, is a, um, a, 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 a subject that goes way back. Let's see here, I'm losing my notes again. Uh, right, okay. So we, the earliest uh, depiction we have of Susanna and the elders actually is in the, is in the Roman catacombs, okay? Christian catacombs. And how is it depicted? It's depicted as a lamb surrounded by two wolves. Wow, okay? Susanna in Hebrew evidently means a lily, which means purity. And of course here, again, we're in the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation, remember, is the Catholic reaction from the late 16th century to the Protestant Reformation, right? So in their eyes, she represents the church, the church that is pure and from, in, from pure of, from the innocent uh, predators of what here, we see, of course, you know, this is a, a street against the Jews, right? And pagans who conspired against the church. Okay, again, frequently she is also thought of as a model for the Virgin Mary who is as associated with the lily, Susanna, and purity, fine. So in almost all representations of Susanna and the elders, Susanna is essentially an object that the men are about to prey on. She is exposed in such a way, the, 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 by the way, the, the Susanna and the elders is, 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 is goes back to, well, again, throughout the Renaissance uh, in, in these kinds of depictions, but she is essentially always um, not only the victim, but she becomes the object of male desire simply by the viewers gazing at her. Uh, uh, the, one of the main uh, um, um, uh, scholars having to do with uh, Artemisia Gentileschi's work is uh, Mary, D., uh, Mary D. Garad, and she says here that it is quoted, it's a remarkable testament to the, to the indomitable male ego that a biblical theme holding forth an exemplar of female chastity should have become in painting a celebration of sexual opportunity. She goes on and says, in that the imagined consequence of the action is possession of a woman who has firmly said no, the covert subject of Susanna theme in Western art is not sedu seduction, but rape. Imagined by artists and presumably their patrons and customers, that's what the sub subject is here. But not really in, um, in Artemisia's uh, telling of it. Basically what she does with it is that this is a woman who is in great distress. Now, if you notice, her nudity is very pale next to their heavy clothing. She's twisting away. There's a contraposto, right? She's twisting away from them. Her, or her legs are almost ready to run. And, but of course, there's something the matter with it. If you see on the lower, the bottom of the painting, her foot is in the water. So she's not going anywhere very, uh, she's really exposed. She's not really be, being, being able to actually run. So she's trapped by them. She's pulling herself away. Her hands are up and it's as if her hands are shielding the whispering. Don't say those things. She seems to be saying with her hands. Um, now, of course, this is supposed to be Susanna and the elders. Elders? Only one is an elder, this guy on the right. And actually, though, so again, she has, I believe, Artemisia has changed the, uh, the text of the, what, what this painting is from, what the subject is from, and turned one of the men into, in fact, a young, dark-haired man, who, if you notice, has his hands both almost on Susanna and also controlling the other man, the other elder man. Ultimately, ultimately, Artemisia's emphasis is on Susanna's very real distress both physically and psychologically. So I wanna emphasize one other thing about this painting. Um, you now understand the subject. 
this is dated. It's dated on the painting of 1610. If that is actually correct, which we have no real, none of the scholars that I've read have any reason to doubt it, she was something like 17 years old when she made this painting. It is highly likely, since she was working in her father's house, who's making paintings also, that he may have helped her in it. But the skill of the painting and the emotion and the clarity, by the way, of the, um, of the composition is remarkable. And it's clear from her later work that this is, the majority of this is by her own hand. So any questions on Susanna and the Elders? No. Nope. Okay, so let's Richard, see. Richard, what is the white figure um, about the- Right hand? here. Yes. Okay, that, okay. It, that is actually his white um, shirt underneath his cloak. Okay. But you know what? It's funny you should mention that because for all the world, I mean, I've been looking at this painting a lot, for all the world, that echoes something that is in Christian iconography a lot, yeah. a dove. Yeah. All right? So I wouldn't be surprised if that was put there purposefully by Artemisia to, uh, to throw in this dove, this Holy Spirit into this scene. And again, her rendition of this really emphasizes her distress, not her availability. Okay. Let's see. Wow. Okie dokie. <laughs> All right, fine. So, uh, so, okay, so this is a painting by uh, Caravaggio, not by Artemisia. The reason I'm showing this to you is because it's going to lead into paintings by Artemisia. And this is Judith beheading Holofernes. Now, let's see here. Judith heading, okay. So I'm going to tell you the story of Judith and Holofernes. Uh, the story of Judith is from the book of Judith, which we do not have, um, meaning it is not in our canon, but it is in the Catholic canon. Uh, it's also in the Latin translation of Jerome. It's a Hebrew work from the Maccabean era. So it's, you know, uh, second temple uh, Judaism. Uh, it is clearly non-historical because a Judith is called essentially a Yehudis, right? Which means literally the Jewish woman. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a, what you would say as a novel. It's a novel about, um, about how good triumphs over evil. So let me quickly go through the story. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Assyrians, sent his general, Holofernes, to conquer Judea and to march and lay siege to Jerusalem. The little town of Bethulia was in a strategic mountain pass on the way to Jerusalem. The elders of the town, when they saw the general coming with his enormous army, they had no idea what to do in the face of what seemed to be certain annihilation. Judith, a daring and beautiful and pious widow, scolded them. And after praying for God's assistance, dressed herself in her finest attire and marched with her loyal maid, Abra, right into the camp of the enemy, enemy general Holofernes. She slowly ingratiates herself with her beauty and intelligence, promising him actually information on the Israelites so that he can, count, he can conquer them. Gaining his trust, she is in fact then allowed access to his tent one night as he lies in a drunken stupor. You can imagine what happens next. She decapitates him takes his head outside to, outside to her maid, maidservant who's standing outside, places it in a bag, and then takes his head back to her fearful countrymen in which she shows we have triumphed. The Assyrians, having lost their leader, disperse, and Israel is saved. Though she's courted by many, Judith remains unmarried the rest of her life. Well, one thing you can immediately see from this horrifying painting is that Caravaggio, and many other artists of the time who have depicted this has changed the story. Nowhere does it say the maid is in the tent with Judith when she assassinates him. She, this maid over here, this old crone is supposed to be waiting outside for Judith to quote, finish her work. So one thing is that that is totally non-textual. Richard, Good. can yes. I ask a question? Doesn't it remind you of the Tamar story? Yes, of course, of course. Um, the, um, this is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the yes, <laughs> to say the least. Um, 
Uh, this is, uh, if, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this painting. This is one of the more horrifying of, of, of Caravaggio's work. Uh, and you'll see though, uh, now it's very, very likely that Artemisia, this is painted in 1599. It's very likely that Artemisia either saw this painting or, uh, uh, or saw a reproduction of it because they're both in Rome. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, oh, by the way, also, uh, not surprising, I'm going to ex explain to you why. Judith, of course, also is seen as an Old Testament typology of what? The Virgin Mary. Uh, and by extension, as a symbol of the church militant, right? Again, the church is mm. counter-reformation, right? The church is fighting against the Protestants, in, both theologically, but also sometimes in actually armed ba battles. But so, how do they get, Richard, how would they think that the Virgin Mary, Miriam, would be so violent. It's not the violence. It's the um, they okay. It's me, uh, I, getting rid of the heretic. Yes, that's part of it. But again, these are typologies. Typologies are not the same. Basically, it, it, the notion of typology, which um, uh, the Catholic Church uses extensively. Uh, in, in, in art and in literature is you find a model in the old, quote, Old Testament, and then you say it foretells who's coming in the, quote, New Testament. That's the way a typology works. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, it only, the, this, the, the courage of Judith of maintaining herself and killing an evil person who was coming to, uh, to annihilate the Jews foretells what the church will be doing in terms of the church militant and the counter-reformation. That's how typologies work, all right? Was this before he was accused of murder, Caraggio? Caraggio was um, yeah, 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 of murder, yeah. Right. I, I, you know what? I don't, I, okay. The honest answer is I don't know. I believe he was accused of murder when he was in Rome and this was painted in Rome as far as we know. So it could, this could have been um, either at the same time, uh, when he was accused of Rome of of, of murder, he was um, he had to flee Rome. So it's unlikely he painted this afterwards. Now, all, now, also, by the way, you should understand that in the Baroque period, by and large, paintings are painted for patrons. So uh, someone ordered this for a reason. Now, of course, the artist can do what he wants with it, or within reason, anyway. Um, but let's not get too far off, uh, uh, off, uh, off topic, all right? So um, let's see here. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good. So again, I pointed out that the old lady maid is not from the text, all right? And also you notice Judith is kind of squeamish about this. She's really not enjoying this. She's looking rather worried about it. In fact, she looked rather young and innocent. Well, she's going to be very different from Artemisia's Judith. So Artemisia paints this, they guesstimate, uh, around 1613. All right. Uh, let's see here. Six, she is all of 19 years old. Uh, this is one of two paintings of the exact same theme. Uh, this one is currently in Naples. Uh, and uh, it was probably a bit larger. You're going to see the second one, what's going on over here, but it is very, very different than the Caravaggio. So how is it different? Well, first of all, the old maid has turned into a young maid, fairly good looking. Judith has turned into perhaps a self-portrait of Artemisia. They are not. Uh, they are not only both in the same room, but they are both um, together. They've kneeled on the bed, okay, and they've pinned him down, and they are both assassinating him, totally outside of the text. All right. Uh, many, many commentators on this painting have said that this is quote a richly autobiographical statement with Artemisia taking her revenge in paint against Augustino Tassi, her father's collaborator and convicted rapist who assumes the form of Holofernes. So revenge painting to say the least, but um, it, is, it, it is an extremely powerful work as you can see. Yes, 
So the, the, the other maiden, not Judith, but the other maiden's name seems to be Bethuel, Bethula. Actually, no, no, Be Beth 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 Bethula is the name of the town. It's a made up name. There is no town of that name. Oh, okay. okay? I get it wrong. The name of the maid, which is not in the original book of Judith, but has now come down. I've seen it in many sources, but I can't find out where it really begins is Abra, A B R A. Which, when As you. Abra Kedabra. Also. Well, no, 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 no. Or, let's put it this way on the internet anyway, it says that actually it is a feminization and shortening of Abraham. Okay. I have, no, then, I have no explanation of why that, that name is in there. And Hall of Fairness was a general that was dispatched by Nebuchadnezzar. So that, that would correct. be the right timing. That, that is correct, that is correct. Right, right. So um, again, it's a, a really, her painting is just as shocking, if not more shocking uh, than Caravaggio. She's really gone uh, taking him uh, really, a, a couple of steps up in terms of the horror of what is going on. Um, so, but there's a determination in Judith's face. She is not the almost innocent uh, face of the Caravaggio, the gentle face of the Caravaggio, the worried face of the Caravaggio. No, this woman knows darn well what she needs to do as she draws that knife across his throat. This is about vengeance. So this is one of two paintings. Uh, the second painting, which is now in the Uffizi, uh, is a little later. I've it was almost it. certainly done from a tracing from the first one. You can see the extreme similarity of the two paintings, but this one is not cut down. So you can see that the painting fully shows his legs and a little bit more space up on top, all right? What's <laughs> changed? What's changed is their costumes have changed. Looks different. Well, why? Because these costumes are, I'm told anyway, much more uh, in tune with Florentine costumes. And these were paint, this painting was painted for, in Florence, for one of the Medici. I so, so um, let's see, one, I'm losing myself here my, with all my notes. Ah, yes, okay. The Grand Duke Cosimo II de Medici. Uh, so that's, his, that's the patron of this painting. Uh, it is different also in so much as the violent severing of his carotid uh, artery dramatizes Holofernes' demise, as you can see. But let's go further. Let's go further. So much so is the blood spurting out that it's spurting on her arm, on her clothing, and on her breast. So... Uh, Artemisia doesn't pull any punches at all. And now this is the second painting that she has done of this subject uh, within what has to be a year or two. Um, so, ah, okay. Now I wanna go back for a moment. Is that back here? Yeah, okay, good. I want you to notice another thing. Uh, what Artemisia does is she unifies this painting. Oh, well, okay, so first of all, the color, this color is called yellow ochre. Okay, this becomes famous. This becomes the color that she uses in a lot of her paintings of a lot of women in the paintings who are wearing this costume. So that's one thing. The second thing is notice how she unifies the painting with blood red. The red, the crimson of his gown, the crimson of her blouse peeking out, the crimson of her blouse over here and over here. And then of course, the red coming out of his neck. She's unifying the painting in a really amazing well, way. So, and here's the two paintings side by side. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah, is right. Oh yeah. yeah and both both of them, both of the the girls, women's costumes mm -hmm. have changed in color. Yes, precisely, precisely right. Because she's painting it for a, a different patron. A patron. Um, now, okay, I do want to qu question you because we have to be honest about this. Everyone says this is like a revenge painting. She is doing this and really in, in paint is striking out at the man who raped her. Okay. The problem is paintings don't really usually work that way. Usually when you, when an artist of this time in the Baroque period paints a painting, it's the patron who decides what they're painting. So 
Maybe she found a, pa a, a patron who wanted a subject like this and then it suited her just fine. So I just I do want to be honest with you exactly what was what could be going on here uh, in terms of these paintings. So let's continue with Judith. Uh, so again, um, okay, so this composition, we see earlier examples of it uh, with her, in her father, Orazio's work, a few years earlier. So she got the general composition probably from her father, but she's done something unusual with it. And what has she done? Well, she's taken this and taken us to a moment that again is not at all in the text. In the text, if you remember, I told you that Holofernes head was put into a bag. No, this is in a basket. Okay, and this is now the moment. This is the moment right after the assassination. And in fact, um, uh, in fact, uh, something else has happened. Again, totally not in the text of the Book of Judith that, she, that uh, uh, Artemisia is inventing. Something has startled them. They are about to escape. They're inside General Holofernes' tent, okay? They are trapped. They're in an enemy camp. They've got to get out with his head and something has disturbed them. They're both looking off to the right. This is uh, what you would call a, an arrested moment. They were in the middle of something, about to leave, and now something stopped them. What is that? And we don't know, but it makes it, 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 it heightens the drama of, the, uh, of this image immeasurably. One other thing you, I want you to notice. I want you to notice, first of all, the two women are, are, are compatriots. They are, are co-conspirators. What can I say? They are, this is sisterhood. We saw in the previous painting, the two women, again, not in the text, to two women are assassinating this general. They have now done that. And now, almost tenderly, Judith is grasping her maidservant's shoulder they are a unit, much, much more of a unit, by the way, than her father painted this scene. And on top of it, this is a mocking painting because Judith has a uh, Holofernes sword just resting casually on her shoulder. And to, to emphasize that, to emphasize that at the end, the pommel of the sword is this screaming oh. head this ah. screaming head, which surely is put there to echo what just happened to Holofernes in his real head. The painting is simply echoing both the drama of the assassination and the dilemma of the women who need to escape and get away to secure their victory. Simply, simply, simply a beautiful and, and, and masterful painting, I would say. Any other questions? Okay, we can go further. Oh, I want to men mention one, one other thing. One thing we see in a number of her paintings, and I don't really have an answer for it, except the fact that she is a woman who's painting women. She very frequently shows a woman with one earring. Okay. Maybe that was her signature. There were a number, okay, very good. There were a number of things that were kind of her signature. One of it was the earring, I believe. Another is with these kinds of details. She will, we're gonna see details like this in where you'll have a decorative object that suddenly has a face in it. And so that echoes her. And also, by the way, again, this, this uh, ochre, this yellow ochre is known as Artemisia ochre, okay? It is a, kind of her trademark, not in every painting, but in many paintings. Let's see what's next. Aha. Okay, fine. Uh, this is considered by many uh, her absolute masterpiece. It's in Detroit. I'd love to go see it sometime. Uh, and it's a complex painting, uh, painted a bit later. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what does it tell me? Okay, right. Um, so, in fact, the art historian who was the, uh, the curator of the show in London, I just mentioned, maintains that, and her name is uh, Le, uh, Letizia Treves, uh, and she's one of the curators of the National Gallery in London, and she maintains that with this painting, Artemisia rightly takes her place among the leading artists of the Italian Baroque. That is really quite a statement for an art historian to say. Um, so, Suddenly, again, we're taking this theme. This is not in the text. 
the deed has been done. If you notice here, so again, we have the youngish handmaid, right? We have her stuffing now here, the head into not a basket, but into the, the bag. They're going to spirit it away, right? You have Judith here, of course, right? And something again has startled them to the west, to the to, to the left, right? Notice this 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 gesture on her of holding this sword. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that as you read the commentaries on these, how transgressive that was. The notion of a woman with a sword is the equivalent of cross-dressing. That's not what women in Baroque Italy do. But she is in this heroine. So it emphasizes her, her status as a heroine, of her strength, of her determination. OK, fine. Um, so the women seem to be, though, caught in the act. So OK, so let's see here. Let me ask you. You're all looking at this. Um, so again, we've got Judith holding the sword, which she has just used. You've got her handmaiden, Abra, right? You have a candle. You have a piece of his armor over here on the table, okay? And they're all looking over to the left. Do you, does anybody notice something strange? That doesn't make sense. Okay, think it through. So okay. You've got a candle and the candle is illuminating her arm and her face. And by the way, notice the, the unusual thing of basically, amazing, right? Half of her face is in shadow, okay? Okay, good, so that works. That candle, that light on there, and that light on this side of her face, but it doesn't make any sense for the light on her hand. There's no way the candle can be lighting her hand. Oops, sorry, we went backwards. No way. That hand, that hand is, be, is, is being illuminated by another light source off stage. And in fact, if you notice, it's that's what's casting the shadow on her face. So suddenly you have two threats, or let's say it's one threat. One threat is being evidenced by the women are looking to the left at some sound, something's happening there but there's obviously a light shining in on them that they are reacting to. Brilliant, dramatic painting that essentially doesn't illustrate, it raises questions. It raises unease about what they're going through. Does the yes. light represent truth? <laughs> um, don't know. You could say that. I've, I, ha I have to tell you, I haven't seen this uh, okay, there's two things. I haven't seen that uh, offered as an explanation for this painting or other paintings where there's light. Uh, and also uh, only one or two, actually only one, only one other uh, commentator on this painting talks about the fact that there is, as far as I'm concerned, there had to be a, a, another source of light outside the picture frame. Most, mo most, most commentators simply ignore it. Uh, but I can't ignore it because to me, there's no way that hand is being illuminated by that candle. Just di yeah. it's a different place in a different uh, place in space. Well, so the maid the maid is not uh, illuminated either. She could be. You, you could say the maid is illuminated by the light to the uh, left, or, or even by implication, maybe a bit by the light of the candle. Uh, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But the, the thing that, uh, that uh, throws the greatest question to me as a viewer is the light on her hand and the cast shadow that it, that's there. And again, it is really quite amazing in so much as you don't usually put half of your heroine's face in shadow, and yet Artemisia does. Okay, we're gonna have to move along because I don't wanna run out of, uh, I don't wanna run out of time, okay. Yale and Cicero. Now, you probably should know this better. It, it, uh, the, uh, the story of Yale and Cicero is from, uh, is from the Book of Judges. And uh, let me just get it in front of me. Okay, Judith, Yale. Okay, very good. Okay, so just to remind you, okay, uh, 
Deborah, a prophetess, you remember, and a judge, advised Barak to mobilize the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun on, on Hartavor to do matter against the king Jabin of Canaan, Canaanite king. Good. Barak mm -hmm. says, okay. He says he'll go, but he says, Deborah, you have to come with me. So she turns to him, and what does she say? She says, all right, but I'm going to prophesy. This is, this is Deborah. She's going to say, but the honor of defeating the Canaanite general that will go to a woman. So the Canaanite army was led by the general uh, Sisera. Good. And they meet in the plain of the, the Estradon plain in, 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 in Israel, of course. And But Sisera's iron-bound chariots got stuck in the mud. It rained the night before, and they were stuck, and they were defeated by the Jewish army, by the Jewish soldier, by led by uh, Barak, right? And so he flees. Cicero, the general, flees his men, flees the, the army that's in disarray, and he arrives at the, uh, at the tent of Heber, okay? Heber is, uh, he's not Jewish, and he's married to a woman named Yael, okay? What does Yael do? She welcomes Cicero into her tent, not the family tent, but her own separate tent, and covers him with a, a blanket. He is, of course, you know, he's just been defeated in battle. He's exhausted. And he asks for a drink of water. What does she do? She gives him a plate of milk instead. Okay. So he commands Yael, as he's drinking the milk, watch over the tent and tell anybody who asks that there's nobody inside the tent. Okay, good. He falls asleep. Quietly then, though, Yael goes into the tent she takes a tent peg and a mallet and, as he's sleeping, pierces his temple and kills him instantly. Good. Uh, so mm -hmm. here you have the issue in which, just as um, uh, Deborah prophesied, a woman is the one who gets the credit for defeating the general of Cicero. There's a song of Deborah. The song of Deborah is considered to be one of the oldest pieces in Tanakh, okay? Very ancient text, uh, and it says, it's long actually, but this is the part I want you to listen to, all right? Extolled, or blessed above women, B-E-I-L, blessed above women in the tent. He asked for water, she gave him milk. She brought him cream in a lordy dish. She stretched forth her hand to the nail, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She smote Sisera and she crushed his head. She crashed, crashed through and transfixed his temples. So what's going on here? Okay, so first of all, I just want to tell you, of the paintings I'm going to show you tonight, this is my least favorite, okay? But it happens to be one in which she is treating, again, a female Jewish heroine. And she's treating it within, again, um, counter-reformation Catholic Italy. What's this got to do with the Counter-Reformation or, 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 or Christianity? Well, as I just told you, in the Song of Deborah, Yael is called Blessed Be Yael Among Women. That's from the Song of Deborah, right? They see it as prefiguring who? The Virgin Mary. Because in the book of Ruth, not Luke, 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 there's a woman named Mary who speaks, sorry, a woman named Elizabeth who speaks to Mary and she says of her, of all women, you are the most blessed and the blessed is, quote, the fruit of your womb. Ah, blessed, of woman, well, blessed among women, blessed among women. Immediately, the Catholics pick up that this is a typology foretelling that a woman will arise, Mary, who will do something good. Interesting, is Elizabeth is also the mother of John, the Baptist. Ah, yes, that Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist. Elizabeth, Mary right, exactly. went to see that, her. That's where, this, that's where this takes place. That is correct. Mary, Mary was Miriam or Mary was pregnant and she went to see Elizabeth. You know and your New Testament, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely correct. Okay. So anyhow, uh, here, uh, here there's a, there was a commentator that I found that actually kind of makes sense of this. Yael and Judith, protected Israel through killing. But Mary will protect Israel through the peaceable action of bringing forth life. 
That's one way to understand the typology. But again, the typology was used a great deal. Yael killing Sisera is typical of Baroque art, again, referencing it uh, in, 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 in theological terms of the Counter-Reformation. So let's go further. Ah, so this is, um, this is a bit later, 1622. And again, Suzanne and the Elders. So you already know the story of Suzanne and the Elders, but this one is, as you can see, quite different than the previous one, the early one from 1610. Um, the, the bottom line here, though, is that, again, you have a woman in distress, a, who, Su Su Susanna, right? You have the men hovering over her, right? They are, she is quite naked, meaning vulnerable, trying to cover herself up, right? Not quite running the way the other one was, but clearly in distress, and in fact, looking heavenward for, for, uh, for salvation or for help from God. And they are hovering over her, very well-dressed men uh, in these uh, beautiful costumes, uh, really contrasting her, her nudity. Again, mostly one full earring here. There's a glimpse of a little earring over there, but again, that signature earring, the signature color of the uh, yellow ochre, or Tamisia yellow ochre. And um, again, a wonderful evocation of, of, of Susanna and the elders. So this, time, this is, this, yes? This time, this time, Richard, her, both her legs are in the water. She's not getting in the water. Mm. She's already. Right. So that makes, I guess, a certain amount of sense in terms of the text, because if you will remember, the text was that she was bathing. So it would make mm. sense that she would maybe have both feet in the water. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Richard, is guess, there a chance, hello? Yeah. Uh, is there a chance that what you identified as his shirt or possibly a dove, which didn't really agree about the dove, okay. could that be a lily and, and uh, representative of his having her somehow attached to him? I didn't understand the last thing you said. The, 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 that the white dove, his, okay, fair enough, but lily, that and, could it be a lily? Because I, I I looked at some pictures of lilies, and with oh. a stretch, it could be. But it would be having her attached to him. The Christian symbol of the dove didn't seem to make too much sense to me um, right. in in the context. The the lily might make sense, but not so much being attached to him. But the lily, i.e., like the lily, the purity of the Virgin Mary. That's and, and and the church right. I, well, and you you reference that her name uh, Shoshana right could be Lily. Yes, exactly right. So that's the um, um, yeah. I, I I would agree. Um, also, by the way, her pose is very similar to a classic um, uh, Hellenistic sculpture of the Crouching Venus. So she's referencing those kinds of things again. These are just the art historical references that that cultured people in the Baroque. A period would would appreciate and see. So moving right along, what do we have here? Ah, this is the painting that I I drew you into. Okay, fine. So this is Esther before Ahasuerus, of course. Um, and again, um, uh, this scene though is not in our Book of Esther. Uh, this is in what's called the Greek Esther. Uh, which again is a um, is a second temple period addition to the book of Esther um, and um, but not in our canon and so let me just quickly read to you the verses that that, that this is referencing. She faints. I'm sorry? This looks like this is the one where she's fainting. That's right but nowhere in our book of Esther does she faint. She doesn't faint. This is this is this is called the Greek Esther okay and so we are in the middle, and of course, but we understand what happens, right? Mordechai has told her, you have to go to the king, even though he hasn't called you, even though the punishment can, could be death for coming in front of the king unbidden, you have to go and you have to plead for the Jews, okay? She says, okay, I'll do it. And, and what does she do? Uh, she fasts, right? That's why we're fasting on Thursday, okay? The, the, the Titus Esther, right? She, and then she gets herself uh, dressed beautifully and here it goes. Then having passed through all the doors, she stood before the king who sat upon his royal throne and was clothed with all his robes of majesty, all glittering with gold and precious stones. And he was very dreadful. 
Then lifting up his countenance that shone with majesty, he looked very fiercely upon her and the queen fell down and was pale and fainted and bowed herself upon the head of the maid that went before her. Then God changed the spirit of the king into mildness who in fear leaped from his throne and took her in his arms till she came to herself again and comforted her with loving words. Esther, what is the matter? I am thy brother, be of good cheer. You shall not die, though our commandment be general, come near. And so he held up his golden, golden scepter and laid it upon her neck and embraced her and said, speak unto me. And then she says to him, I saw you, my Lord, as an angel of God, and my heart, was, my heart was troubled for fear of your majesty, for wonderful you are, and your countenance is full of grace. And as she was speaking, she fell down again in faintness, and the king was troubled, and his servants comforted her. That's Greek Esther. That's what Artemisia is illustrating, is depicting here. But... That's the Esther it. that deserves an Academy Award. Exactly, exactly. This well, is a total fake. This is a total theatric, a theatricality. And in fact, um, it is a theatrical uh, fate. And in fact, so, she is modeled on a contemporary actress of the time. And he is ma modeled on a Commedia de Arte foolish king, a fop which is exactly what he looks like, okay? So the whole thing, anyone who would see this would immediately get the message that what is, well, well, let me just go further though. It's not just a message of her, um, of, of her, a woman fainting in front of the majesty of the king, which is what the text says. No, it's a message really of a woman manipulating the king of the whole world. Ah, but spirits. Look okay totally wrapping him around her little finger because of her dramatic uh, her, her drama talk about being a drama queen okay um, richard richard what's the story with his hat because if you you said he looks like a fob but look at his hat don't they look like spikes no that's a crown that's a crown yeah. a, 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 a typical uh, baroque version of a crown they the silliest looking things I've ever seen. Right? You You're see right, because it looks to me like a pan, hand, the handle of a pan at the uh, top, I don't know. Right, so uh, let me just point out a couple of other things. One here, again, she's very good at putting little details in. Um, and uh, one detail she has, can you see my cursor? You see this, this, this head, this head here, right here, this head on the chair that he's sitting on and the chair has feet, okay? It's almost like this head is an echo of Haman. That's one thing. Second thing is, when I first was looking at this painting, it seemed like her, her, her faint was so fake, fake that actually she was only being supported by one hand of one of her handmaids. I actually was wrong. If you look very closely in here on around her waist, the other handmaid's hands are actually supporting her. Still, the faint is totally fake. There's no doubt about it. And well, so she, this did, is, hmm, she yes? did fast for three days. Yes, but again... Um, Supposedly. the fact that I've always seen this painting as a, as a theatrical send up of, of, of her manipulating him and, and basically being able to get his permission because we remember what she's going to say. She's going to now invite him to one of two banquets yeah, in which true. finally Haman will be uh, denounced, right? So, uh, but she needs to get through the quota, uh, the, uh, the wall of, she wasn't allowed to go in front of the king unbidden. That was the only thing. So she had to manipulate him. Um, so anyway, let's go further. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and by the way, you probably won't be able to see that this painting was in London, uh, part of the London exhibition, but uh, as far as I know, it's either on its way back. I don't think this is another venue of the London exhibition, but it normally is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Aha, okie dokie. David and Bathsheba, I don't have to tell you that story. So, but this is really a, um, a very different take on David and Bathsheba, as far as I'm concerned, because almost every uh, depiction of David and Bathsheba 
Bathsheba is naked. She is almost that. totally nude. Here, while yes, she doesn't have anything on top, her nudity is really mostly covered up by her arm across her chest, right? And um, frequently in David and Bathsheba. So the, the, the subject of David and Bathsheba is frequently, again, a time for Baroque artists to show off a nude female body being looked at lustfully by a man, King David. Well, Artemisia's kind of turned the tables on this. What has she done? Because can you even find David in this painting? Is you have to look awfully. He's all the way back here, all the way in the distance. Oh. Okay, he's on the balcony of the palace, right? Oh, by the way, just to, to tell you, this was probably painted by more than one person. Uh, Artemisia almost certainly did the figures and uh, one or two artists uh, may have done the, um, uh, the architecture, okay? Uh, but what you have here is almost a domestic scene. You have one handmaid offering her different kinds of jewelry. What kind of, what kind of necklace would you like to wear today? Another woman is actually combing out her hair. That's a comb and her long hair. And another is preparing the bath water or, or holding this big basin where she was, let's say, washing her feet. She was bathing, right? So again, this painting turns the tables on the traditional voyeuristic uh, uh, depiction of, of David and Bathsheba and makes it into a much more feminine, almost domestic scene among women. Again, very typical of Artemisia where she shows really groups of women doing things. And if there's a male character, he's fr frequently um, suppressed. <coughs> ah, okay. This I have to tell you is like one of my favorites. Um, middle of her career. And it is Lot and his daughters. It is a fascinating painting in so much as um, it deals with really one of the most disturbing scenes in, 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 in the Bible, incest, right? But again, uh, it is very different, very, very different than earlier and certainly Baroque depictions of Lot and his daughters. Most depictions of Lot and his daughters are of Lot either half naked, not fully, usually not fully naked, and one or both of the daughters undressed, effectively seducing their father. The painting is, the paintings are usually about just unbridled sexuality, and which, by the way, as you know from the story of Lot and his daughters, is not so far off the case, right? They felt that they had to uh, sexually seduced their father because they thought that no one else was in the, in, in the world and they had to populate the world, right? Or at least continue his line because they had just witnessed the destruction of Sodom. Okay, so this painting though is not about that at all. This is an absolute sonata in, in elegance and in rhythms. Notice, three profiles, okay? Go straight, going straight across, Two, two of them going in one direction and one returning, bringing you, so your eyes go across and then back. And in the sonata, three arms, one, two, and three arms crossing over, crossing, ac crossing across the, the, the surface of the painting, all right? Two sets of left legs, one left leg, second left leg. What's with him? He's getting inebriated. Right? And as a matter of fact, his stockings have fallen down right here. All right? And so, what's this daughter doing? She has just finished pouring a wine jug to the glass that he's holding in his hand. And she is kind of curiously just finished cutting a piece of bread. So, this is ripe with symbolism. And as a symbolism, the way the symbolism works is that the symbolism, so, okay, so we know the story. We know the story from our, 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 uh, our Torah. Um, but the symbolism here that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that signals something to me. Again, let me ask you, is there something really strange in this painting? You know the story of, of Lot and his daughters. Is there something that makes no sense? Okay. Were the daughters together when they did this? Yes. They have the yes. two daughters. They, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are always shown two daughters and, and Lot in the middle. That is the standard uh, depiction of Lot and his daughters. And there's, there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds of them. 
from the early Renaissance, even before the early Renaissance, straight through. And so, it, you know what I noticed? Cave, that's a cave that they're in, right? They were supposed to be in a cave. That is correct. They're all barefoot. Oops. They're all barefoot. That's not, no, actually, they're not all barefoot. You're getting warm. Then let me tell you what the same thing is that I actually now have done some research on. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is no reason why this daughter's foot should be on a rock. Makes no sense. It's just, mm -hmm. just, you, and I've looked at dozens of depictions of Latin's daughters. There's no rocks in it, or they're all sitting on a rock, but never one foot on a rock when the others are not. Okay. So what's that about? And then the other thing that I have seen in a few other um, depictions is they oh, you always have wine because that's what get them, gets them drunk, right? And sometimes even you have bread. But what's wine and bread? Think like a Roman Catholic. Sacrament. The sacrament, sacrament. the Eucharist. That is correct. And it is, in according to Roman Catholicism, it is the moment when in the mass that the wine is actually represents or turns into the blood of Jesus and the bread is his body. Okay, so that, well, what's that got to do with Lot and his daughters? Let's go back to the rock. If your head is as crazy as mine is, you will think foot on rock, what does that mean? That's a phrase from, uh, actually I don't have it in front of me, uh, from the, the Gospels, which, which essentially Jesus says to Peter, yeah. upon this rock, this I will rock build island. my church. That's rock. Oh my God, wait a minute. What happens with, <laughs> I love this. What happens with one of the daughters, right? She, who does she give birth to? Moab. Moab. And who's Moab? He's the ancestor of Ruth. And uh, Ruth is the ancestor of David. The, the and Messiah. David, from a Christian point of view, is the ancestor of Jesus and the Messiah. So that's what's going on here. This must be the daughter that gives birth to Moab. And this is this whole scene, which is totally different than the ribald scenes of most uh, depictions of Lot and his daughters, is actually a scene of, of, of saying that in this act of incest is the beginning of the road to the Messiah. Wow. Well, wow. You know what? She you... does it, she does it gently and lovingly. This is not a sexual painting. This is a painting of familial love and concern. What an artist to take a subject like this and to simply almost explode it, doing so in her time, from her perspective, never seen a painting like this before, of this, of this subject, okay? One of her masterpieces as far as I'm concerned. So we're running a little, getting close on time, so let me go further. We have, I think, a few more paintings. Uh, there's the rock. <laughs> and oh, so this, see, she's not barefoot, she's wearing a, a sandal. Oh, okay. You can't see it when you're, unless you bring it up close from here. Right. Exactly. 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 Okay. Now, um, okay. So this is uh, a very late Susanna and the Elders. Excuse me. Um, and it is, uh, in fact, it is the uh, latest dated painting that we have of hers. We're back to the this subject, so I don't have to explain the subject to, to you, except that things are a little bit different. In the previous uh, depictions of Susanna and the elders, the elders were above her. They were hovering over her, oppressing her. This is now almost more democratic. They are arraigned across the page, ac ac sorry, ac across the canvas, right? And if you'll notice, this one, she is the most clothed. This is the most different than typical Baroque depictions of Susanna and the elders, which are almost always opportunities for men to be leering at naked women. This is not that. She's almost, almost a clothed woman. And if you'll notice, she's reaching up as it were for God's help. She's reaching up into the heavens. But so she's actually is, looking at them or looking in the looks, same direction. The other ones correct. I think were in the other direction. So let's go, let, okay, so we're gonna see this again, look. Uh, there we go. Okay. Neither of the, she's looking away here. She's looking to heaven up, but not at them. This one, you could easily say she's looking at them or through them up to heavens. Look at how a subject develops over an artist's career. 
okay, from 1610 to 1652. An amazingly inventive artist, an artist who's exploring themes over her careers. And by the way, again, I wanna emphasize, she's using our material. This is all Jewish material as seen through Roman Catholic eyes, but most importantly, as seen through a woman's eyes. A woman who had a very, very tough time at the beginning. She throughout her career, remember, is unusual in so much as that she is a woman working in a man's world, and yet she, she, she supports herself with her painting her entire life. She actually, she marries, has at least, I believe, two or three children and raises them single-handedly. She travels not only from Rome, but to Florence. She ends up in Naples. She ends up dying in Naples. She ends up in, um, in, in London, visiting her father. In fact, this may have been painted, his last one may have been painted in London. No, sorry, that was the pre previous one. She gets around Europe. She's a successful artist who makes it, who makes it in, in 17th century uh, uh, Baroque times. Let's see if I have another, another image for you. Yes, and this is just uh, uh, looking at the two, uh, the two Judiths. Again, an inventive artist. I cannot emphasize enough what I showed you just before in terms of her invention here of, of this one, uh, uh, this, this one of, of her reaching up into heaven, all right? And also the juxtaposing of the el elders hovering over her, hovering over her, and then changing finally at the very end. And then this, a totally, these are invented subjects. She's using the core of Judith and Holofernes, and then suddenly saying, I'm going to talk to you about Judith and her handmaid, about female solidarity that's endangered. This is a really a remarkable, remarkable artist. And I uh, don't want to leave her yet. Um, and so I thank you very much for allowing me to share her with you. Um, and I'm not sure <laughs> what this will prepare you. I'm not sure. 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 Yeah, it seems that actually, 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 it seems to be an echo. Richard, Richard, thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, the echo is developed. I think I we think really we enjoyed, enjoyed this presentation. presentation.